This is Kelly Hill, executive editor of RCR Wireless News. I'm here at Mobile World Congress 2019 at the Spirant booth with Steve Douglas of Spirant. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Uh, first, I wanted to get into what conversations that you guys are having with folks around network slicing. Hi, Kelly. Um, uh, network slicing is becoming a very hot topic with a number of our customers at the moment. It, not about that they're necessarily implementing them today, but trying to actually understand or figure out what the network slices are going to look like for the industries and the use cases that they're, that they're exploring at the moment. Mm -hmm. So areas like uh, automotive, uh, Industry 4.0 is an interesting topic for them, mm -hmm. but also trying to understand how those slices impact their future network infrastructure and build out. So today they're not going and developing the slices yet in the, in the operational networks. What they're asking us to do is really come in and help them. How do we emulate and model that to work out what should a slice look like? How should it perform? How should it be turned up in, the, in their network when it's going to go live? And just as importantly, how are they going to guarantee that the slice is going to deliver on the SLAs? Um, and we're helping them through that process today with a sort of a new generation of service assurance which combines active testing and emulation of the slices uh, to allow them to do that. Um, so that sort of gets starts to get into business case for 5G. You know, if we have these slices, who can we sell them to? You know, where's the monetization of all of this network investment that we've started to do? Um, you know, talk a little bit about what you're seeing on that front. Yeah, I mean, the business case is still the holy grail for a lot of it, and a lot of our customers at the moment, to, to be bluntly honest, the business case is still not there fully proven. Um, there's a long way to go in terms of you know, 5G getting rolled out, the industries they want to embrace, uh, understanding what it can deliver for them. Um, and that's going to take quite a period of time before we're going to see. I mean, I would say very much of the early 5G use cases will probably be more of the traditional uh, consumer business that we do today. The fixed wireless access, which doesn't really need the slice on day one. What actually we're seeing our customers realize though, because that business case is potentially going to take a little bit longer, um, they're still spending quite heavily on their 4G networks. Uh, and that means justifying the spend on 5G is difficult. So they're looking for ways to bring down the costs anywhere they can. And we're starting to see them now talk to us a lot more about could we bring automation technologies into the current environments and use that automation technologies to actually start reducing that costs. And rather than having to do something really complex and transform the network to do it, is there areas which are really low-hanging fruit that we can do today? And we're seeing that around the service assurance side where traditional manual processes of we're monitoring the networks and then talking with other elements in the networks to get things resolved and the human element of that could be automated right here, right now. Uh, doing things a lot faster and bringing things to market a lot faster. Can you give us any examples of something that might be low-hanging fruit? Are we talking like maybe low-level tickets or? E exactly. I mean, a good example would be, uh, you know, I'm in the, uh, the network now. I'm simply actively monitoring or uh, for a potential issue. So I'm not waiting until the fault happens. Um, if I do see it, uh, what I'm now doing is automating the, uh, the systems to the orchestrators, the policy enforcement that are in the network to then solve that. Now that can be as simple as you know, a subscriber in their networks uh, suddenly loses service uh, to, to, to us understanding, well actually the issue was their data records in the home location register weren't configured correctly, which is a real common problem. Now I just tell the system to, uh, through an automation and, and integration with that, uh, you know, reprovision them. Um, and then the system, our systems would then again uh, actively test did that solve the issue mm -hmm. and, and made sure that didn't hurt anything else. All of a sudden you're closing the loop and you're taking the human element out of it and you're keeping costs down. So another, I think another aspect of this um, that we had been sort of chatting about earlier uh, was security and how Spiron is starting, you know, is, is thinking about security in the context of all of these different evolutions that are going on in the network. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, security is always going to be a hot topic, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the industry. Historically, a lot of the time, we, we've, you know, the industry's been in a bit of mindset. It's about securing the perimeter. Yes, um, It's about, you know, if we can protect that, that's the first starting point. And then we, we talk a little bit about, you know, maybe analytics is going to be the future of, of security. But Sparrow sort of has been thinking with the industry for a period of time, you know, the best line of defense is attack, attack yourself. 
But how can you do that without hurting yourself? How can you do that continuously to understand your security vulnerabilities? So again, taking the same concepts of what we've been doing in service assurance, where we would be actively monitoring for, say, performance or quality, mm -hmm. why not do the same for security? Mm -hmm. Putting something in the network that is under our control, which acts as that bad actor, it's not trying to attack one of your network components. We would emulate what we're trying to attack in the network. That's what would get hurt under our control, but we would understand through that process, did your security work? Was it still fit for purpose? Where are the gaps? And this is really critical now for areas like data breach, where we're starting to see in the industry, you know, obviously with legislation, it's critical we protect private data, and it's critical our customers are able to demonstrate to regulators and the governments that they are staying ahead of the game. Uh, and we think this is the future of where security is going, this active, emulated security in the network. And one of the other things that was interesting that you mentioned was this concept of digital twins. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I, I, I've heard about it as sort of in, 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 a, in, a, like in a smart building context, mm -hmm. but I think it's really interesting to think about it as, in, as a network concept and, you know, know how my network is going to work because I, I have a digital, I, because I've built a, a twin of it that I can experiment with and prod and test and yeah. Uh, we think it's going to be critical going forward. I mean, the way the networks of the future now are, they're, they're not static systems anymore, which we could, you know, in a lab, just replicate one and that's the investment we would do. The networks are dynamic. They're going to be distributed out to the edges. Capacity processing will get dynamically moved all over the place. You can't spend to build a completely second network. But we live now in a softwareized world. Why not emulate that? Have an emulated software, emulated digital twin of the network that allows you to run all those scenarios against the what ifs. Try to figure out things like if I'm going to build out in the future, say, edge data centers, um, do I really need them? I could emulate that in the twin, work out whether or not they're going to be valuable to me in terms of, say, reducing the latency. All of those use cases could be put into place. Then in the future, you could understand the digital twin could actually be part of the operational process itself. So when my live network needs, say, a software upgrade and one of these agile new releases, you could quickly validate this in the twin before it goes operationally live. Uh, again, giving you more confidence to the system, it becomes part of the living sort of system. Um, this is not uncommon. We've seen this in the industry world. You saw that in the, in the smart uh, buildings. It's been, digital twins has been around for, for a while. Now it's time for the communications industry to embrace it, and we have the technology to do that now uh, because we're now a softwareized world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the time. Really appreciate it, and enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks.